of Nick's Halloween Spooktacular. Okay, so today I've got a double feature for you. First, we're looking at The Wampier, a short story from about 1816. It was one of the first modern vampire stories, and interestingly, doesn't feature a vampire with fangs, but instead goes around with a knife, cutting his victim's throats and sucking their blood the old-fashioned way. What, none of you sucked blood like that? Wimps. Anyway, it was written by John William Polidori, an Englishman of Italian descent. It follows an Englishman who goes in with a mysterious British nobleman named Lord of Ruthven, following him first to Rome and then to Greece. They encounter a variety of people in their travels, and they all die, mysteriously drained of their blood. Somewhere on the road, Lord Ruthven is attacked by bandits and seemingly dies, though reappears after a while when the main character returns to London. Ruthven decides to marry his friend's sister, and on their wedding night, the poor girl is found without any blood, with her husband nowhere to be seen. Okay, so there's not much to the story, but it sets the standard of the vampire formula. A mysterious stranger with a dark past travels to exotic locales, superstitious people who tell the legend of vampires, and beautiful young girls in trouble. Really, the story is more famous for where it was written. In 1816 in the Swiss Alps, amidst the year with no summer. It was written as part of a ghost story contest held with the famed poet Lord Byron, and when it was published, the book used his name to help sell copies. However, it was kind of half-written by Byron, and his contributions are published as Fragment of a Novel. While it isn't terrible, it lost the ghost story contest to none other than Mary Shelley's masterpiece, Frankenstein. That's Frankenstein. Think about it. Both the first modern science fiction and the first modern horror stories were written on the same night. Surely the cosmos convened to make it happen. At first, I thought this was just a little short story that was remembered more for its influence than for its quality, but it was adapted time and again. First, there was a French play by the author Charles Noidier, which was turned into two large operas. Think about that. Operatic vampires. That's badass. There were also a couple of British plays, as well as a couple of novels, which more or less stole the same basic story. There was also some lame movie in the 40s called The Vampire's Ghost. Lastly, there was a soap opera, not like a real opera, that ran on the BBC in the 90s. I think it was trying to ride the Barnabas Collins wave. All this helped spark a vampire craze in Victorian London. Vampire stories became popular for a while, but there was a little one in 1872 simply titled Carmilla that was downright scandalous. Written by Sheridan Le Fanu in Predating Dracula, it tells the story of a young Victorian girl named Laura being seduced by another Victorian girl called Carmilla. Yes, like that. It starts out when she's just six years old and has a dream of a woman sneaking into her nursery and biting her chest for no reason. Years later, when she's grown, she meets the same girl from the dream who also claims to have had a dream about her. They get to know each other very, very well, though several people around suddenly begin dying in the slowest, most painful manners possible. And when Laura begins getting weaker and weaker, empty tombs begin to be unearthed. So this book's big claim to fame is that it casts a vampirism light over lesbianism. Don't forget, back in the Victorian era, they hated homosexuals and thought they were products of mental illness and children of the devil! I mean, as a modern person, I can say I don't hate lesbians, but I am against the gays. NOT WHILE I'M LIVING, damn it! Anyway, the story does have long descriptions of how the two girls love and care for each other, and how their parents encourage this relationship. I can't help but feel it's a commentary on how people wanted to tolerate homosexuality, but society as a whole treated them like vampires, seducing good women away from wholesome families. Maybe Lee Finau was a lesbian? I don't know. The story has been adapted numerous times. There have been lots of books that make reference to the story with both pro- and anti-lesbian themes. There were a couple of stage plays across several countries and languages, a few rock songs mention the story, and even a modern opera that was produced in the 1970s. There's also a Japanese lesbian magazine named after the book. Ah, Japan, I love you so. But the thing you really want to hear about, the only adaptations that really matter, are the movies. There are a few loose adaptations, but one of the main ones is the French Et Mourir de Plaisir, which updates the story to then-modern times of the 1960s and sets it in Italy as opposed to England. 
and in true French fashion, focuses on the lesbian eroticism of the story. Naturally, this was trend for the English language release. Speaking of Italy, there was an Italian production of the novel, which starred none other than the vampire king himself, Christopher Frank Carandini Lee. Allegedly, the script to the film was written in one day, as it was promised to be ready when it wasn't. Interestingly, while Lee appeared in the shitty Italian version, Hammer Films actually produced their own films of Carmilla, three to be exact, starring sexy British babes. And Peter Cushing. <laughs> I bet he was cushioning his Peter, too. And, like the novel so many years ago, it was scandalous for being about women seducing other women. There was also a Polish film made in 1980 about the novel, as well as numerous other movies that make direct reference to it. There was a web series adaptation of it that was put up on YouTube. <laughs> YouTube celebrities, freaking bums, get a real job! Anyway, pretty much any movie that has a lesbian vampire either directly references this book or owes its existence to it. And see, all these adaptations, taking the story and reworking it for generation after generation, it's keeping the story alive, artificial and unholy. The producers of the films are the real vampires, sinking their fangs into good, virginal stories and sucking every last drop of blood out until all that remains is a shriveled husk. Oh sure, it looks beautiful and immaculate on the outside, but if you dare to look below the surface, you will see the abyss staring back at you.